how can we prove that the Prophet Muhammad, the peace and praise be upon him, followed the same principle as Noah, Abraham, Idris, uh, Lot, Adam, Jesus, Moses? Now we have to return back to his what? His scripture. So, the scripture was sent down to Prophet Muhammad, the peace and praise be upon him, affirming the same principle that I had before. There are so many verses in the Quran. And you've said you've read the Quran twice, so you know. I'll give you one example, but you already know. God says, أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No, there is no God except Him. لا إله إلا الله. So, furthermore, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad is the best of Prophets. He's better than all other Prophets. And so if that is the case, then surely the revelation, the guidance that God sends to him has to be the best of guidance compared to the other books that came before. We agree on that, right? Only logically it makes sense. And so that is why we believe the Quran is the true message of God. The Quran. Okay, if it's the true message of God and it's the best scripture to ever be sent down to the best prophet, then it has to have enough validity in it. Meaning, for example, miracles in the Quran scientific miracles or other modern science, modern miracles. We can give many. I'll give you a couple. For example, over 1400 years ago when the Quran was revealed to God, so it was revealed to Sayyid Muhammad, by God, the Quran talks about waves underneath waves. Meaning we have in the ocean and the seas, we have waves on top. But actually recently, within the last 50 years or so, exactly, as you said, it's proven that there's waves underneath the waves. I'll give you another example. My brother, who was just here just now, he's a beekeeper. God says in the Quran, يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَطُونِهَا شراب. It comes out from his stomach's honey. God refers to a single bee as says stomachs, meaning more than one stomach. Beekeepers know that bees have two stomachs. One of them to take in food and the other to make honey. God mentioned this in the Quran that he gave to Muhammad over 1400 years ago. You know, there are so many evidences. I've just given you a couple. It's like it's all, when it all comes pieces together, it's like, how can this not be the truth? These are two, uh, two very like minute things, like the bees and the waves, so, uh, and uh, he's mentioned a lot the prophecy of uh, the war between the Roman Empire and the Persians, that it was like the Romans would lose the war within three to nine years. Exactly. But, if, if Muhammad, Muhammad traveled a lot as a prophet, uh, he was a trader beforehand. Yeah. He went to Syria and stuff like that. He could have known from the, the disposition of the two empires from talking to people within Syria, within Antioch, mm. Damascus, whatever, that uh, something like this could happen. Because the Romans and the Persians have been fighting wars for centuries beforehand. Yeah. What were they? It's, it's not a huge statement, it's not a huge prophecy to say that yeah. the Romans are going to be defeated in a war against the Persians if they've been fighting wars constantly, losing one side, losing the other. It's not necessarily a big prophecy saying there's going to be a war, but the way he predicted it via the Quran, because it wasn't his prediction, it was God telling him what will happen, and the Romans will be defeated by the Persians, means and you have to understand the Romans at that time were a super giant. And yes, they would go to wars with the Persians, but they wouldn't be defeated. So that is where the prophecy comes in. But as you said, they, they had defeated the Persians in the past. But not in the manner that they defeated them from three to nine years after this, this verse was revealed. It wasn't in their manner. It was known to be different, and that's why it's recorded in the his, history books. Remind me, because my history is getting mixed up now. Did yeah. the Romans defeat the Persians? Or was <laughs> Meaning, the Romans have kind of The Romans were overcome Between three to nine years But again, this is one of many examples So you've got, for example, the bees You've got, example, the waves And these are modern science examples Then you have all the other evidences Such as the beautiful language that is used in the Quran Was, that, the, was this the intention of Allah When he revealed these things To show in the future as a proof to people that how could Muhammad have known about the bees, about the waves? Exactly. Was this the intention? So within these prophecies, you can say, well, it's not really prophecies because that means it comes from a prophet. But actually, it's from God. Through the Quran, what it does, it proves the validity of the Quran. God is giving us signs, showing us that actually, this is the right way. This is the right path. This is the path that he wants us to follow. Is this his intention? To say it is his intention, 
again, as we spoke before, because he's the creator, as a creation, I can't say God wanted this, 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 and this, and this. But we go up based on what he's told us. So, of course, behind this, you know, the, the, from the wisdoms of giving such, you know, miracles, you it's to guide people. Ideas, if you want, you can take this. Finish it. <laughs> yeah. I think we've got some water as well, if you want some water. Water. Yeah, water. Yeah. No, it's okay. Go on, what's No, no, I, I want to make sure you have water first. Muslims were taught to be extremely generous. Yeah. But yeah, so the point is that. Yeah, so you can say, for example, the wisdoms behind it. Again, we don't know all the wisdoms. To say that we know what God wanted is one thing. But to say that we can extrapolate some things, for example, yes, when God says these miracles are going to happen, and they are, especially if they're, for example, something that is not necessarily likely to happen, or something that is not known to mankind, then when it happens, it increases the validity of the Quran, and it increases someone like you, for example, your faith in the Quran, that this is actually the word of God. But the verse itself, uh, the bees, but the waves, it's just tangential to these that in the future we've come to see that they're actually correct scientifically. As in, over 1400 years ago we didn't know that, and now today we know that? Yeah. Exactly. Well, it wasn't the intention to, uh, 1400 years later, for us to come to the realization of this. But that's the thing, that's the thing, right? We believe that the Quran is timeless. If it's timeless, then it's suitable for every time and every place. And therefore, yes, and I, obviously I, I don't know everything about Islam, so I have to refer to people who are more knowledgeable than me. So I asked one of my teachers, we all do, exactly. So I asked one of my teachers about this and he said, actually, yes, there would be certain stages in Islam, before, for example, modern science, where they wouldn't maybe understand how there were waves underneath waves, but they'd believe in it. And so therefore that proves that the Quran is timeless. And if it's timeless, then it's perfect for every single time and place. Just how it's perfect for you now and us as a civilization in the 21st century. How does that sound? Yeah, it's consistent. So if this revelation is consistent and it's valid, then surely the one who has been sent this revelation is also consistent and valid, the Prophet Muhammad. And he had his own, not just via the Quran, he had his own miracles. You know, for example, being, uh, there's many miracles, for example, being extremely strong. Or for example, having a seal of prophethood on the back of his neck. Yeah, which, his yeah. night journey is uh, the splitting of the moon. The splitting of the moon, exactly. You know this stuff. You've built a good foundation from yourself. It feels like you know what the truth is and it is trying to come out of you and you just want to follow it. I don't know if he, in truth Muhammad did split the moon. I don't know if he did. Uh, he went to Jerusalem during the night. He went to Jerusalem on one night, yeah. But ultimately, look, these are based on textual evidences, right? We believe God says in the Quran, meaning the hour, meaning the day of judgment, has come close and the moon has split. Textual evidence. Then, to back it up, modern day evidence, scientists have found recently that actually there was a time where the moon was split. Really? Yeah. My brother knows more, but he's. Uh, he likes, he's into physics and whatnot. But the point is that, uh, and you mentioned another one, for example. What was the other one you mentioned? Uh, the night journey. Huh? The, 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 night journey. The, the night journey. Again, we have textual evidence. Subhanallah. <laughs> meaning, praise be the one who took his servant, meaning Muhammad. He took Muhammad, God took Muhammad, and sent him on a night journey to Masjid Al Aqsa in Jerusalem uh, from Masjid Al Haram in Mecca. Now, to add further textual evidences, when he came back, the Arabs at the time, they were like, how could you possibly go there in one night and come back? When he told them about it. And so they started to test him. They said, okay, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it looks like, what does it look like? And what God we believe from the, from the authentic text, we believe that when Prophet Muhammad was having a conversation with them, God showed him the Al-Aqsa Mosque and he described it to them as he was looking at Al-Aqsa Mosque. Again, textual evidence to backing backing up the points that were in the Quran, the, the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad. 
Can we get back to why Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophet? Why he is the Prophet? Good, fantastic. These are amazing questions, by the way. So, ultimately, there has to be an end to everything, no? There has to be an end to your life. There has to be an end to certain feelings that you go through. There has to be an end to everything. And we believe, we believe that there is an end to this world. And if there's an end to this world, we also believe that there is a judgment day. And ultimately, this judgment day, people will see the consequences of their actions that they've done in the, in the world. You cannot be someone bad and treat people very badly and murder and kill people, but not expect any consequence. And so the, the day of true justice is the final day. And then afterwards, the hereafter. We believe Muslims that if you've done good in this world and you followed what God wants from you, you will enter heaven, paradise. And if you've done bad in this world, you enter the hellfire. So, I mean, is heaven a garden or which rivers flow and will be seated on thrones yeah. and will have uh, beautiful women? Yeah, that's the paradise. What about for the women though? But let's get on to that. Remind me of that question. And but, uh, what, another question. Please. Yeah. Uh, these women uh, that will be with us in paradise, if we go there, inshallah. inshallah. Um, are they real human women that have existed on the planet in our time yeah. as humans, or are they some sort of spirit, some sort of gene? Or something like that? Beautiful questions. Um, let's save them because we need to go to a more important question which is why is Prophet Muhammad the last messenger? Of course. So we said, okay, the day of judgment, that's where the day of true justice will come. And then you'll go into the next stage, which is heaven or hell. We agree on that, right? So if there's a day of judgment where everything cuts off, then there has to be eventually a last prophet. The question is, as we said before, if this is the last prophet, we said that he is the best prophet. And therefore he's come with the best revelation in order to be the seal of prophets. As God says in the Quran, Khatim and Nabiyyin, meaning he is the seal of all prophets. And in another, yeah, so that is the point of it. There has to be an end to it. There has to be an end to the line of the prophets. And it's very interesting because Prophet Muhammad, the peace of praise be upon him, he never had any sons that lived, uh, you know, past puberty. And if he did, someone, one of them could claim, oh, look, you know, I, I'm, Prophet is my direct father. You know, so. But so Prophet Muhammad was just a human. He affirmed constantly he was just a human. Beautiful. Sent here like anyone else. Beautiful. We have the same beliefs. So that's a main thing that we agree on. And we go into the tangents such as uh, what will we get in Jannah? Was the first question? Yeah. So what we'll get in Jannah, as Muslims, we believe that we die doing what God wants to me, from you, meaning worship Him alone according to the right faith, Islamic faith, what the Prophet Muhammad taught us and how to worship God and how to live our lives. Then uh, we will get in Jannah what God has described from us. But we have to know the principle, first of all, which is whatever He's described from us, for us, sorry, in Jannah, we don't truly fathom it until we're there. And that, that adds to the beauty of it. How can we say, yeah? Well, was it not described in the Quran? As it was described. It was described for sure. It was described. But we didn't truly fathom it. I'll give you an example. Death is described. We all know we're going to die. We all know we're going to be in that coffin or in that underneath the ground six foot deep. But do you know how it feels? No, but we understand the concept. And so just with, with, with Jannah, with Paradise, we understand that there'll be rivers flowing, there'll be four different types of rivers and you can drink from those rivers and you'll be having so much fun and anything you want you've got as, as you wish. But why, but can you fathom it? No, because you don't have it. That's the point of it. But why describe it? In order to kind of motivate people and to achieve that. You want to describe something. When I describe something extremely in detail, I say, for example, I have a beautiful jewelry, a, 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 a diamond ring, you know, it's got beautiful curves on the outside with 24, 24 specific diamonds within the main diamond. I'm like, wow, I want this. I show you, for example, I have a jewel behind my back. I show you the jewel. Then I put it back behind my back. You're going to say to me, I want to see that jewel again. Oh, or you're going to say, how do I get a jewel? And that's the point. When you describe it, it motivates you in order to, to achieve that. So it's, it's, it's sort of dangled in front of you like a, it's a place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it seems, it seems to me kind of carnal. It seems kind of material mm. uh, to desire these things. Like surely the afterlife should be immaterial. It should be. I'm not. Well, I say should be. You know, who am I to say what should be? Mm. Well, You're right. These, these things, they, they, they're things in this life, in this earthly life, that would appeal to us. The jewels, the women, the beautiful women, 
the gardens and the rich, which rivers flow, the thrones, the golden thrones facing each other. It's beautiful. It's beautiful it's, what it's you're too, saying. It's, it sounds beautiful, but it's something that we would appeal to us as humans, as, as materialistic humans on this earth now. But when we die, why do these things matter? Good. That's a beautiful question. Amazing question. Which is what, which is the answer to it is when you want someone, for example, let's say you have goodness, you have something that's really good and you really want to share it, but everyone around you may be reluctant or they don't really know about it. You want to entice them in order to bring them in for them to share the goodness with you. But surely and you should be enticed more by so you've got to be model perfection by, by being a good person. That shouldn't entice you more than material things. But if that is the nature of people, then you have to use the nature of people in order to entice them. How do we know the nature of people is women, is uh, beautiful things, cattle and that kind of stuff? Because God says in the Quran, He says, Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahawat min nisa'i wal banina wal qanatir al muqantarati min al dhahabi wal fitta wal khayl al musawwama wal an'ami wal harb. Dalik al al hayat al dunya. He says, We have made, we have beautified, or made, made it like really pleasant to people, the woman. You know, as a man, we have desires, we love women. You know, and to have children. You want your lineage to, to be a strong lineage. You want your children, whether they be male or female, to be successful people, good people on this earth. No? And so he's made those things desired towards us. Also, cattle. The fact that you can have a farm, for example, or can ride a horse or a camel, especially previously as well, it worked as a mode of transport and a means of food, means of provision. And so, therefore, if we have things that you can, those are things that we desire. And so if we desire those things, surely they can be used in order to entice us. You know, you like women, I like women. And so therefore, using women, for example, to be in the paradise is enticing us and motivating us to be that good person. Motivating us to be as best person we probably can, possibly can, and also follow the right guidance from God. Does that make sense? To, to use uh, wealth and, and riches, it, it just it doesn't appeal to me personally. Mm. Like it, I feel like the appeal uh, well, to, be, to be a good human, to be to be uh, forced for good, you know. Yeah. I know. I know. With Islam, it's uh, you're very focused on uh, living in this world and, and building yourself in this world and helping people around you mm. to uh, be materially. Comfortable, but uh, in in the in the afterlife, in the yeah. afterlife, these things I, I don't know. That's the thing, right? Because as I said before, we don't truly fathom the afterlife. As Cause, Muslims, cause these, sorry, yeah, because these things they come with like pain and pleasure. They they it's it's chaos. Like it's they they come with like. Uh, Sort of, uh, it comes with not necessarily defeat, but it comes with hardship. It comes with hardship, yeah, exactly. But that's the whole point. That's what I was saying to you before, like fathoming it. For example, let's take the example of women. Yes, we might have to go through certain difficulties, go through breakups, that kind of stuff. But that same feeling with women, we won't have in an afterlife, even though there are women there. Exactly, because the women are perfect. We're perfect. And not, not perfect in that sense, but our situation is an amazing situation there's no stress there's no worry and also god has give will give us something things that we don't need to worry about and so yes so, there's so a comparison are these, are these things these women these thrones these gardens are they representations or are they literal no they're literal they're literal but again as we said your feelings for them in this world won't be like your feelings for them in the next world they'll be high, the highest one without any lows without any lows because why because that is ultimately the hereafter where there's no, there's no sadness. That is the hereafter where we're aiming for. How can it be the hereafter be the same joys as this world? And don't get me wrong, you know, when you do good deeds, God also says in the Quran that when you do good deeds, You know, he says, race towards goodness or race towards his mercy. And, you know, like a, a Jannah, meaning paradise, the size of the heavens and the earth, or skies on the earth. Meaning, it's not just based on what we're enticed by, or you can say desires. It's just based on other stuff. He's teaching us that do good, and via this doing good, get into paradise. 
by His mercy. When we do good, you know, we feel like, okay, we're doing good so we can achieve paradise, we can achieve heaven. Okay. You agree with that? I think you agree. That doing good would lead us to paradise. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, Rather, doing good is the only thing that will lead us to paradise. Not, not necessarily enticing in and its own. Doing good leads us to paradise. And then just before entering, it's from the mercy of God. You say, you say it's, there's no laws, it's the highest form. Uh, say specifically with these women that we will inherit if we come to Jannah. Uh, will we take our pleasure with these women? Will it be, will it be carnal like that as well? So like ultimately, it is on the earth, yeah, so, the highest form. Of, what is the highest form of kind of pleasure? I don't know. So ultimately, let's go necessarily away because this is a very specific example. Ultimately, in Jannah, if you enter Jannah, you will get anything you want, anything your soul desires. As God says in the Quran, He says, whatever you want in Jannah is yours, is what you desire. And whatever you love to look at is yours. Meaning you see stuff and you're like, wow, this is amazing. So the point is, it's not revolved around women. It's not revolved around what women want in Jannah. No, it's revolved around, you know, beauty, rewards from what we've done in this world. Okay. Yeah? Well, well, so what you want. Literally, yeah. you will have this woman. If you want a woman, you have a woman. Only if you want. Of course, because it's wanting. Like, for example, uh, if you, if you, wants fruits for example as god says that there are fruits in, in jannah if you want fruits you get fruit so the main principle is not around women it's not around fruits it's not no it's whatever you want you will get whatever you desire if you enter jannah you will get that but there's a condition to enter jannah why, why do we want these things on this earth in this life we want them to say our pleasures we want a good woman to uh, make us happy to be with them we want to eat good food to, to feel the pleasure of eating food yeah we want to drink food. Is it? It's not alcohol in the, the rivers somewhere. There is alcohol. Is it? But it's not. It's, well, it was toxic. toxic. Yeah, yeah. It's different. We, we, also, want, we want these things to say our pleasures in this life. In the next life, will they say us as well? This is a good question, and I think you're alluding to something else, which is what? There will be, there may be stuff, stuff in Jannah that we have never experienced in this world. So. If there's stuff in Jannah you've never experienced in this world, that proves that you cannot truly fathom what Jannah is going to be like. Even if it's referring to stuff that we know. Such as, for example, uh, wine. And for example, I, that proves my point. Wine in this world won't be like wine in the next in Jannah. And so that may be the same, for example, with women. But that's my point. It's based on the principle. You can't truly fathom it, and anything you want, you'll get. And it'll be better than anything you've achieved in this, in this world. So is it sort of like, you know Plato? What's that? Uh, Greek philosopher Plato. I don't know. Uh, he had like the idea of the forms, like there's a... Uh, God created perfect forms of things that are... Uh, and everything else on this material level is like a shadow of that. So like wine here is like a shadow of wine of the perfect form of wine. Or like... Generally, wine. generally as Muslims we believe no. We believe that your main focus should be in the hereafter. We have a specific dua, supplication that we say as well, which is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al Meaning, oh God, give us good in this world. Atina fi dunya hasana. Give us good in this world, good in the next world, and save us from the hellfire. Those are three supplications. Two of them are specifically for this world, uh, for the next world, for the hereafter. Save us from the fire and give us good in the next world. Meaning, give us jannah. One of them is for this world. And so this, this, does, this gives us the balance that we have to have as Muslims. The main focus is what is happening, is coming next, hereafter. But you have to focus, you have to be able to have certain parts of this world in order to achieve Jannah. That's why God says, Don't forget your parts from, the, from this world. I'll give you an example. You want to worship God in the mosque, true monotheistic uh, faith. You worship Him, how do you get to the mosque? You gotta get a car because it's so far. So you're gonna buy a car. Are you gonna say, oh look, you know, the car I have, you know, it's from the dunya, I can't have it. Do you get it? And so that that part where we say, okay, you have it's from the dunya, can you explain dunya? What's this? Meaning it's from this world. It's from the pleasures of this world. But you use it in order to 
for your, the betterment of your hereafter. You're using your car to go to the mosque or to worship God in a monotheistic manner. You need these things. Exactly. You need things, certain things from this world. If they help you to get into the hereafter, the, the Jannah, we can use it, no problem. But to say our main focus... These things are good. Exactly. These things are good. It's the way you use them. Exactly. Is our main focus, I want to buy that car specifically, just on... No, no. We want to use that car in order to do good. Does that make sense? I think we are generally on the same beliefs. What do you think? Yeah. Because... Uh, yeah, go on. Generally on the same beliefs, yeah. I want to ask you a question now. A very important one. You're asking all these in-depth questions about Jannah. You know there's a condition to Jannah. There's a condition to get into paradise. That condition, as the Prophet Muhammad, he mentioned, peace and praise be upon him, Man qa la ilaha illallah dakhla al-jannah And another hadith Man qa la ilaha illallah khalisa min qalbih dakhla al-jannah Or kama qa He said Whoever says there is no God worthy of worship From his heart Sincerely then he will enter jannah Meaning there is no God worthy of worship And Prophet Muhammad is his final messenger And this appeals to people of the book Like the Jews and the Christians Not necessarily Muslims To everyone So not necessarily Muhammad or Rasulullah But I'll just la ilaha illallah and believe it truly and practice it and you know inherit Jannah. No, it's talking about because the other hadiths and, and other verses in the Quran they say that actually you cannot part of the shahad, part of the testimony of faith is to believe in the Prophet Muhammad as he sent his, I wouldn't say messengers, but he sent his companions to all around the world and he said when they become Muslim it's via a testimony of faith. There is no God worthy of worship except I accept Allah and I, meaning the Prophet Muhammad, is his final message, as we spoke about and we spoke about his revelation. So I want to ask you, if you want Jannah, you have to fulfill those conditions of saying the Shahada. So what's stopping you saying the Shahada? Um, it's, it's my idea of, of Muhammad and uh, his, his existence on the planet, his, his life, his walk, his mission. Um, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit of a cynical approach to it. Mm. I, I'd say Muhammad did the things he did. He said the things he did. Uh, I don't want to call him like a madman. I don't think he was a madman. Mm. Um, it was different. He may, he may have truly believed. I'm not. I, I can't know. But uh, he, can, he constructed it all. His religion. Uh, the revelations in the Quran, they seem, they seem too convenient for me. Well, that's the point. By the way, did you know that Prophet Muhammad and peace be, and praise be upon him was illiterate? He was illiterate, he couldn't read and write. But how do we confirm this? We can confirm it, number one, via the Quran. Obviously, if you don't believe in the Quran, then you can, you can affirm it by, by a, a well-known knowledge. If, for example, not even hadiths, well known knowledge. That, that would confirm this. Yes, there are hadiths that would confirm this by Zayd ibn Thabit. But even that, even from external links, it was well known that the leader of the Arabs, the leader of the Muslims, could not read and write. It was well known. You ask, you know, for example, the leader of the. How would you prove such a thing? Surely Muhammad himself is the only person who could prove that. So that, that is and the why, point. Why would he reveal it if, if what he wants is to build a religion and a cult of personality yeah. and form a state within Arabia yeah. to, uh, I, don't, I don't know what he wanted to, just to satisfy himself. Yeah. I guess this is a tangent, but what we're saying is that there is proof, number one, we said from the verses in the Quran, number two, from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. You mean the consistency of the Quran with the, the messages of the Quran? Yeah, but also no, the Quran says, yes, but we're saying that even the companions during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, it was well-known knowledge. Even the non-Muslims, for example, that were in uh, the Byzantine Empire knew that the lead of the Arabs, being Prophet Muhammad, he's based upon him, did not, did not speak, did not read and write. How did they know this? As well known knowledge, he used to send letters to them, not written by himself, but written by someone else. <laughs> and also they asked about them. Just like for example Abu Sufyan, who was a companion, he went upon one of the leaders and he that leader asks about the Prophet Muhammad. You know? So our point is that the Prophet Muhammad, we believe that he is the, as we said before, he is the seal of all prophets. And he came not just for a specific nation, for example, Church of Israel and Jesus. No. We believe that he was sent for every single he was sent for you, he was sent for me, he was sent for the people that lived 500, 600 years ago. Why? Based on the verse in the Quran, We did not send you except as a mercy to mankind. And he says himself in the hadith, 
the ayah being sent to the whole of mankind. Okay, what is the message? Go on. But does it not also say that he was sent specifically to the Arab people and given the Quran in perfect Arabic? Yes, because God chose the Arabic people, the Arab people, in order for the Quran to be revealed on them, but not solely to them, meaning not only them. And that is why you have people who did not speak Arabic becoming Muslims. You know, or people who weren't Arab becoming Muslims, such as Salman al Farsi. Salman al Farisi, which is the well known companion of the Prophet Muhammad, so he's the Persian, the one who saw the seal at the back of his neck, I'm sure you know about it. He was an Arab. And then you see millions of Muslims today who don't even speak Arabic, but they're Muslim. That's the point of the verse in the Quran that he was sent, God sent Prophet Muhammad as a mercy to all of mankind. So all of mankind so includes would, Arabs and non-Arabs. You would encourage people to learn Arabic and read oh, definitely. Quran in the original. Definitely. Because then you're connecting with the actual language that this God, this God revealed his revelation. And that takes you to your next level. Because we want to understand what God wants from us. But ultimately the concepts of Islam can be understood in any language. There's one God worthy to be worshipped. We believe in fasting one month a year. Prayers five times a day. You can understand this in any language. You want to go further. And yes, you need to understand Arabic language. But we agree on that. So back to the Prophet Muhammad, as we said before, his revelation is a special revelation with all the miracles that were found in it. The beauty of the language that was used that was cannot be uh, replicated. Even God says in the Quran, he, he invokes, so he doesn't invoke, but he calls out those people who are non Muslim during that time in the polytheist of Mecca, says, Bring one chapter like this Quran. Then they couldn't. Then he said, okay, bring 10 lines like this Quran. They couldn't. He said, okay, bring one him, verse. They called him a poet, a mad poet. And they called him a poet. And they called him a madman who was a magician. But back, back to the illiteracy. Yeah. Uh, I don't... Sure, he could, he could get someone to ascribe to write a letter from him to the Byzantines. Um, but it doesn't prove to me that he was illiterate. It, it seems convenient to me that he would be illiterate because then the message is coming directly from Allah. His uh, stories, he, he couldn't have read these Old Testament stories that he's revealing in the Quran, which are being re revealed. He couldn't have done that if he was illiterate. That, that is convenient for Muhammad. But oh, that's the point. The fact that he was illiterate proves that it wasn't from himself, it was from God. Yeah, so I'm saying we have textual evidence that proves that he was he was illiterate, but not just based on our Islamic textual evidence. Well known knowledge during that time that the leader of the Arabs, as I said, was illiterate. If I open up any history book, they will confirm that yes, of a Muhammad, he was illiterate. But how did they confirm? Through basic knowledge. So for example, if you ask your grandma, uh, I'm not sure if she's still around. Uh, if I have this specific issue in my body, medical issue, how do I deal with it? She'll be able to tell the, the old medicines of old in Ireland. Is that not the case? Yeah, because she's... Why? Because it's, and then you say to her, okay, but how can I prove that this is something true or that you've learned? It's something that's passed down and it's common knowledge. Yeah. But how do we know that Speaker's Corner only happens on a Sunday? It's common knowledge, it's well known. It's passed down from generation to generation. People come here every Sunday only. But who confirms the common knowledge? It's the people. How do we know it's every Sunday that we come here? I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you establish it as a fact that he was illiterate other than Muhammad himself's word and his behavior? Like he couldn't read, so he never read. But he could have been fighting this. He could have been fighting his illiteracy. He could have been like, pretending to, to be illiterate. Again, how would you disprove it? Like you could, again, know. even if he was literate, we don't believe he was literate. Even if he was literate, it doesn't take away from the things that he, or the you can say the prophecy, the miracles he was given by God. It doesn't take away from it. Because how would he know, for example? But how would he know, for example, that the, the Roman Empire would be overtaken? How would he know about waves under waves? Because he traveled, he traveled to Syria and stuff like that as a merchant. Okay, but how would he know about waves under waves? How would he know what's inside the bee? How would he know that one side of the what of the fly has a cure and the other side has a disease? He doesn't know how, this how stuff. How would he know about the, the formation of the, the fetus in the womb? Exactly. I know. That's my point. Yeah, I, understand. I understand. And all of this is adding validity to what you know that you need to believe and what you believe deep down. The validity of that. This man, this perfect man, not perfect, sorry, this amazing man was a prophet. And he brought all of these evidence just to prove it. He wasn't an angel, he was a prophet. Okay. So, 
the illiteracy thing again, I just, I, I really, I really don't see it. And it, it feels like it is an important facet of Islam that it would be illiterate. It's not necessarily an important facet. Why? Because previous prophets were literate and they still received revelation. Sure, sure. But it's mentioned multiple times in the Quran. Uh, how, how could uh, this knowledge come to Muhammad of all these stories, Jonah, Noah, all these stories that I mentioned in the Quran? How could it come to a man who is illiterate and doesn't read or write? How, how could he possibly know? It's mentioned multiple times. No, it's not mentioned illiteracy in the Quran. It's mentioned in a tradition, in hadith. Muhammad's illiteracy is not mentioned. In the Quran, as far as I can remember, no. No, we have... I thought I read it We have Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, meaning the first revelation that was sent down, God said to Prophet Muhammad, read, read, meaning in the name of the, the one who created, meaning God. Say that again, sorry. Read in the name of the one who has created, meaning read in the name of God. Then we know from a tradition, meaning hadith, that he said, when it happened to him, I can't read. And this happened three times. So it's from a tradition. This but it's is not, uh, yes, it's in Bukhari. Uh, I think it's in the first chapter as well, second chapter. But it's not from the Quran. It's not from the Quran. And that's the point, right? And we're saying, even if he was literate. We, do, we believe Bukhari when he says this is about the Prophet. Yeah, we believe it. Now, even if he was literate, then he'd be like the previous prophets who were literate but received the message or the revelation from God and portrayed it. Or, or you can say, showed people the tabliyah, the meaning portrayed the true message of God. What is their difference? Especially if you see again the stuff that he was talking about. What does illiteracy or literacy got to do with waves underneath waves, or mountains being pegs, or the sky being in a certain shape? What does that got to do with it? Because even if you were literate, you wouldn't know this stuff. This is modern day science in the last hundred years or so. So all of this is adding validity. Does that make it a bit more clearer? I suppose we can, we can leave the illiteracy for, for another time. It's, uh, it's oh, I think we've answered it. I think I've answered it. We say even if we've he was we've literate. We've answered it by, by saying that it's not important. Even if he was literate, it doesn't prove a change in his scripture or his validity of his, uh, you can say, narration for God. Again, what does literacy have to do with knowing what is underneath the waves? Have you memorized the Quran? I have, yeah. 100%? Yeah. I, I bow to your knowledge here. About... Don't bow to my knowledge. If bow to not, God. Because I, I, I remember, I thought I remembered reading in the Quran that it does say that he's It doesn't say that he's in it. As far as I know. Oh, so it's on, it's on no, you're right. It. You're, right. you're right. You're right. Rasul al ummiya al ladi. Yeah, it's in. Yeah. It is mentioned in the Quran. A messenger that was illiterate. You're right. But again, it returns back to what we're saying. What, it's proven in the Quran. What's the, what's the context of this verse? It's right, and I'll have to find the verse. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because it's, we have to look at when we say context, look before and after. We, we need the context, though. Yeah. People, yeah. I know people, I've seen videos, they mention the, the killings. Uh, yeah. Not just the point of the killing of infidels, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Silly. You're right. Yeah, it is. In the original of the Torah. Yeah. Okay. We have. We have a lot of people who have no? Okay. All the people who are the Prophet, 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 the the Messenger, the Prophet, who was illiterate, the one that they find written in the original Torah and the original Bible. So we believe that Prophet Muhammad was actually referred to in the original Bible and original Torah. He tells them to do good and, he's, and he prohibits them from doing evil. And he makes like the, the good things halal for them, meaning permissible. And all the evil things or disgusting things he prohibits for them. And the verse goes on until we have at the end. So those ones who raise him up, meaning honor him, and they give victory to him, and they follow his guidance or his light that he was sent with, they are the true successful people. Why, why did I mention in this verse that he was a little Rasul and Nabi al-Ummi, the ones who followed the Messenger, the Prophet, 
the illiterate one, the one that they find in their original Torah and this Bible. Is from the yeah, so this is a different verse, but it's different. So he says, لنا في هذه الدنيا حسنة. So this is a supplication, a dua. He's saying, oh God, uh, give us in this world and the next, or give us in this world good, and in the next world good. إنا هدنا إليك. Meaning we were like guided towards you, just referring to the Jews. قال عذاب يصيبه من أشاء. Meaning this punishment, or I punish anyone who I want. ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء. And my mercy envelops everything. فسأكتبها للذين يتقون ويأتون الزكاة والذين هم بآياتنا يؤمنون. Meaning, so I will write my mercy. Meaning, I will give mercy to the ones who have true uh, God consciousness and they give their zakah, uh, obligatory 2.5% of their wealth. And the ones who are believing in our, in our signs. And then it's just the verse about the Prophet Muhammad. So there's no direct. Uh, oh, it's the brothers. Yeah. But as we said, even if he was literate, he wouldn't change what he came with. Well, 100%. Yeah, he was literate, yeah. He couldn't read the right. But they obviously he could speak, obviously. And he could understand or whatnot. And this, it is important. Do you think it's important? It is important because it's mentioned in the Quran. And I thank you for mentioning it because I said wrongly that it wasn't mentioned in the Quran, but you were right. That's the whole point. God says in the Quran, our God says in the Quran, Those are the ones he spoke about, specific people, those are the ones to be guided. So follow their guidance. He didn't say follow them. And so even me, I make mistakes, we all make mistakes, even if you're the most, the biggest Islamic scholar in the world, you're going to make mistakes. You want to follow their guidance, not follow them. So you ha- in that sense, you had the guidance. You said, no, it is in the Quran. And I didn't have the guidance. So, um, I think. Do we, do we think it's an important thing that uh, he was a little bit. He was, it was mentioned in the Quran, so it is important. Okay. What is important? Why is it important? Number one, it's important because it's mentioned in the Quran. But secondly, it's important so that we know the context of how all the situation was. For someone to be illiterate and receive the miracles and the revelation that he had, which we've spoken about, adds more validity to this person who couldn't have come from it from themselves, especially because they're illiterate, or mainly because they're illiterate. Yeah. That's the whole point of it. How could he, he could never have studied the Old Testament of the Jews if he was illiterate? Exactly. It could, it could only have been revealed from God. Exactly. This is very convenient for Muhammad. No, but you, you can also say what is very convenient is knowing the, that, that the waves underneath the waves are there, and knowing that the mountains are pegged. It's all the same in that sense, you know what I'm saying? We can't just pick out a specific thing and say, oh, it's convenient. We have to look at the whole picture. Like the people who say with the verses, oh, you say kill all non-Muslims. Oh, don't look at the context about it. We have to look at the whole picture. How do you feel? A bit better? I'm not 100% but uh, for now, can we move on to something else? Sure, go ahead. Um, I get, well, it's not, it's not a complete change of subject. Again, back to convenience. Uh, the convenience of, of seeing the verses in the Quran uh, that were revealed, such as uh, Muhammad being allowed to marry the wife of his adopted son. Yeah. Why, why in, in a, what, what is the importance of this for, for a religion, for all peoples, that uh, God would reveal that Muhammad can do this specific thing? Yeah, okay, good, very good. So we believe that the Prophet Muhammad, the peace and praise be upon him, isn't like any one from his nation, meaning the people who lived during his time and after him. We believe he, because he wasn't like us, God has given him some rulings that he has to apply that are specific to him. For example, praying in the night. We pray five times a day. There was a specific prayer that he had to pray during the night as well. And so there are certain rulings that are specific to him. One of them is that he ordered him to marry Zainab. The, Zainab, good, the previous wife of his adopted son. That's a specific ruling to him, the wisdoms God knows. Another, for example, specific ruling to him was once he said to, it's actually a verse in the Quran, he said to Muhammad, peace of praise be upon him, meaning, your wives now, whoever you want, keep them. Whoever you, don't, whoever you decide to divorce, now is your time. From now on, you cannot change it. And so from that point onwards, he could not marry anyone else and he could not divorce anyone. Then divorce any of his wives. Again, specific ruling to him. So he had specific rulings and this was one of them. 
Why, why would God specifically rule Zainab or Muhammad? Ultimately, so again, this is one of the wisdoms. She was a very beautiful woman, as far as I know. I, I, do, I don't know, I never saw her. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, but ultimately, we say, meaning it was seen as an ease upon the Muslims, as according to the verse of the Quran. But the main thing is that this is from the wisdom of God. And if we're saying that there are specific rulings to the Prophet Muhammad, then we have to understand the context of these specific rulings as well. And maybe we won't understand these specific the contents of them because we are not the Prophet Muhammad. And we don't know his feelings that he felt, or for example, his understanding that he had in regards to everything around him or some things that he knew. Does that make sense? We don't know the context. No, we know the context, but do we truly understand what I'm saying is, do we truly understand the wisdoms of God that he, that, that, for the reason around it? He said, okay, Likael, I'll get the exact verse. He gave us reason. But do we un if, if you believe that, that it is God talking to Muhammad and revealing these things to Muhammad, sure. But I don't believe this, and I, I look at this verse about Zainab being able to, or Muhammad being able to marry Zainab, and uh, the yeah. whole thing about adopted sons, it's, it's not valid anymore. I can't remember specifically what, what was said. I remember, oh Prophet, when you said to the one for whom Allah has done a favor and you two have done a favor. Oh, wait, one second. It's a favor. Okay, one second. Uh, keep your wife and fear Allah while concealing within yourself what Allah was going to reveal. And so you were considering the people, whereas. Wait, wait, what can. Well, concealing. Within yourself, what Allah was going to reveal. From here, Muhammad Shahid, meaning this is where the evidence is, what we're looking at. And so you were considering the people. Whereas Allah was more worthy of your consideration. So when Zayd totally lost interest in keeping his wife, we gave her to you in marriage so that there would be no blame on the believers for marrying the ex wives of their adopted sons after their divorce. And Allah's command is totally binding. By the way, God, Prophet Muhammad himself, didn't approach Zainab. God married him to Zainab. But it, it does say, well, conceal him within yourself as in the Prophet. No, that's from before. That's from before. This is a different, this is a different context. For whom Allah has done a favor, you too have done a favor. Keep your wife from fear Allah. He's talking about how he was with the people. The main thing is here. And so you were considering the people, whereas Allah was more worthy of your consideration. As in considering what the people would think if you exactly. married Zainab. Yes. So when so, Zayd, does that not mean that the Prophet Muhammad wanted to marry Zainab? He had desire for Zainab. Well, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I didn't have knowledge of it. But the point is that it's ruling specifically to him. When we say this is from the, from the Quran, and we believe it. But uh, you can check that verse as well. You can read it. Verse 37. Uh, where's it gone? Verse 37, chapter 33. Yeah. Look into it more and I'll see. Yeah. Well, I, I think, to be honest with you, the main thing is the main principles of Islam. Everything else you can kind of speak about and whatnot. But the main thing is that you understand the principle of Islam, principles of Islam, and I believe you do. And I believe you agree with them as well. Yeah, but there's just certain things like this within the Quran itself that, you know, uh, they just strike me as like. I don't know, materialistic maybe, you know, maybe yeah. Prophet Muhammad, he, he wanted Zainab uh, to marry her, but he was constrained by the laws saying you can't marry uh, the wife of your adopted son. Oh, and, then, and then God reveals a verse saying you can and uh, this, uh, it's not binding upon you. So you can do this. Ultimately, there are, number one, I'd say to you, number one, as you said yourself, Prophet Muhammad was a man. He's a place to be a part of. He was a man. He wasn't an angel. So, so therefore, he has the desires that men have, generally speaking. He has desires for women, just how we have desires for women. That's number one. Number two is that there are some things in the Quran that you say, okay, oh, that has, happens to be very convenient for the Prophet Muhammad. But actually, if you look about it, there are some times in the Quran that God actually reprimands the Prophet Muhammad. He says to him, Ya ayyuhu nabi, lima tuharrimu ma hallallahu laka tabatari ma baata wajik. He said, O oh, oh, yeah, meaning, O oh, Prophet, why do you prohibit that what God has made, what I have made, meaning God, uh, halal for you? 
meaning it's okay for you to do it, it's permissible. Why do you make it prohibited for yourself in order to please your wife? Why are you making something that is permissible prohibited? What was this in reference to? This is a, it's a long story, but in reference to uh, a difference, we can say, a difference of opinion between the wives of the Prophet Muhammad and consuming honey. Okay, it's, it's a side story. But the main thing is that uh, he reprimanded him for an act that he done. Don't make what I have made prohi prohibit, uh, you know, permissible for you, prohibited. Why? Because it goes into religion now. And so to say, oh, it was convenient for God, for, for the Prophet Muhammad, okay, but was it convenient for Prophet Muhammad to be reprimanded like this? So that's the point. That's the point, right? So well, it isn't... To, to show to the, the believing people that uh, Prophet Muhammad is not uh, out, outside the law of Allah. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's exactly that the point. He has to... Oh, he has to implement the, 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 the religion of Islam himself. It shows that it refers to him as well, of course. Of course, exactly. Yeah, but th this would reconfirm the people in their faith. So it would be convenient. Muhammad, I think he was a genius, you know. I think a very smart man, very capable, obviously. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I think uh, like he, he could have thought of these things tactically in his mind. That yeah. if, I, if I reveal this verse from God, reprimand me, mm. people are, are going to say this 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 Quran. Uh, Ultimately, it's not Muhammad dictating to the people. It's clearly God dictating to the people because Muhammad is under the judgment of Allah Himself. Exactly. But ultimately, you can say that all verses are convenient. Was it convenient for him to have restrictions for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to have restrictions in regards to who he marries from that, from that specific time onwards and who he divorces? I say it's inconvenient for him though. That's my point. It's not to do with the Prophet Muhammad. People would look at him differently if there was no restrictions on him. If he, yeah. if he gave no restrictions to himself, say like saying Christian cult leaders you see in America, they take the, as wives, the, the the sisters and the, the daughters of their followers and they say it's because God said I can do it. You know? Yeah, but then obviously we're proving the validity of the Quran and that is from God. Because ultimately how can we how can we question God's judgment? God has said it, how can we question his judgment? Do you understand? Me as a non believer I would say I don't know if God said it, you know? Then you have to that's what we spoke about is the miracles and of the Quran that proves that Quran is true. You know it's true. In regards to the miracles that are in the Quran, you know the miracles are true, right? For example, the waves and the bees and whatnot. The split of the moon and, and I don't know if these things happen, I can't confirm it 100%. That requires more research from yourself. But uh, before I, I want to, I think you're, I think we believe in the same principles, generally speaking. I think I want to guide, help you, push you to the right path, but I think that requires a bit more uh, research from yourself and you asking questions to people like myself and honestly I'm there you know if you take my number this is where this place is so beautiful man exactly the dialogue you know it's it, it's only going towards the truth exactly it's only going towards our personal development you know but what I would advise you if you allow me to advise is a parting advice which is number one understand the whole concept of Islam in and itself once you understand that you've got to start the journey of learning Islam you will be in a better situation once you know the truth, accept it, become Muslim and then research everything you need to research. Instead of looking at something from the outside, trying to find not necessarily flaws but where you could go wrong before going into it. Why? Because you already believe in genuine the main principles of God. You believe in the relationship between God and, and humans. I, I would feel if I did something like this that maybe I'll open myself up to self-deception. Uh, Perhaps I could deceive myself if I take it all as true initially and then I do my research. But One thing I can if promise. If I'm so committed to it, uh, maybe I, I won't question myself if, if something comes up that I would question. You know? we be, we've agreed on about 90%, I think, of stuff, generally speaking. We believe in also in Satan as well, Shaitan. Yeah, and we believe that Satan, whenever he sees good, he wants to stop it. Uh, I think you can see probably the work of shaitan or, or evil jinns, uh, some, some sort of malevolent spirit of manifesting in people who aren't uh, morally whole, you know? Like I see, yeah. I see in you, you're clean, you're, you, you talk, your discourse is very... Yeah. 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 You, you seem like a good person to me. But that's our point. I, I can see when I talk to other people, 
if they're, they're going crazy and they're, they're screaming and they're, they're clearly full of hate, uh, this might be some sort of malevolent influence, Shaitan, whatever you want to call it. That's my point. When Shaitan sees you going towards good, he wants to stop you. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim, Christian, Jew, whatever. So now you, I know, and you know deep down as well, you're making this journey towards God to the right truth, Islam. He will try to stop you in every single way possible. And that is why I'm advising you specifically, my brother, that what, once you've aggrieved in the main principles of Islam, accept it. Because you don't know how shaitan works. He's trying to attack you in order for you to not get this goodness, to not get Jannah in the next life, which is ultimately our goal. The goal is not this world. I try, I try to avoid like arrogance and stuff like that. Exactly. I try to not think I have all the questions figured out. If God is calling you, and I'm, I'm inviting you now to accept this now. But obviously, what we need, obviously, we need, we need to do more research before that uh, to look into the Quran and specifically Prophet Muhammad. So you have like a book on the we have loads of books. Do you have the That's my specialist. Really? Yeah. So you specific, anything you could give me, I, I'd appreciate. I'll give you a couple of booklets, and also I'll give you my number. So if you have any, we'll go over there. 